Hi everyone, welcome to Lectures by Omar. In this video, we will be discussing about rheumatic heart disease. Before moving on to rheumatic heart disease, we need to know about rheumatic fever. So let me define what a rheumatic fever is. So rheumatic fever is an acute immunologically mediated multi-system inflammatory disease. So let's write those points down. So firstly, uh, rheumatic fever is an acute disease and it is immunologically mediated. So the mechanism is an immunological reaction and it involves several systems. So it inv involves the CDS system, the neurological, the CNS system and it in uh, involves our joints. So it's a multi-system inflammatory disease. And the peculiar feature is it occurs or it follows group A streptococcal infection. So it follows a group A streptococcal infection. Now how does a group A streptococcal infection usually manifest as? It usually manifests as pharyngitis. So rheumatic fever is an acute disorder that develops uh, a few weeks after streptococcal pharyngitis. Now rheumatic heart disease is actually a manifestation and uh, you know it's one of the presentations of rheumatic fever. So rheumatic fever may present as an acute rheumatic carditis which may then progress to the chronic rheumatic heart disease. So that's how it moves. Now coming to the history part. So as we have said the first point that is it follows group A streptococcal infection, group A streptococcal pharyngitis. Usually uh, it takes about two to three weeks. So there is a two to three weeks delay. Why is, it, why is this uh, delay for? This is where the immunological reaction, this is a time required for development of immunological reaction. Now what are the two types? So it could be an acute rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease and there and it could progress with recurrences and with healing of the acute RHD it could progress into a chronic RHD, a chronic rheumatic heart disease. And the age group as we can expect the, uh, as I've said it follows streptococcal pharyngitis right. Now streptococcal pharyngitis usually affects children from the age of 5 to 15 years. So this is a common age group that is affected and these children can develop acute rheumatic heart disease about as we have said two to six weeks later and if the attacks of rheumatic uh, disease occur later the these children as they grow up when they become adults they could progress into chronic rheumatic heart disease now are all children equally vulnerable actually you know the streptococcal infection uh, is more prevalent in the economically de depressed and the low so lower socioeconomic group so lower socioeconomic group are more affected than the uh, established or economically well of people. So that's about it. Now let's move into the pathogenesis. So the first point that we have said is it is an immunologically mediated reaction, right? So it's an immune reaction. Now it involves both the cell mediated immunity and the humoral immunity. So that's one thing that we need to know. It's a combination of cell mediated immunity and the humoral immunity uh, which plays a role in rheumatic fever. So in cell mediated immunity what happens is that the CD4 cells, these CD4 T cells, they will uh, activate a response, a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. So there will be a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. What do the CD4 T cells do? These CD4 T cells, they will react against the M antigens. So the streptococcus has M antigens. So these CD4 T cells will react against the M antigens. And these M antigens are actually similar in structure to the cardiac self antigens. So what happens is that there will be a cross reaction that, that will occur and these CD4 T cells will also respond against the cardiac self antigen. So they cross react with our cardiac self antigens and as a result what happens is that they will release cytokines and these cytokines will activate macrophages. So macrophages get activated because of the reaction by the CDT4 T cells. What about, what is the role of humoral immunity? So we know that humoral immunity is mediated by antibodies, right? What these antibodies do, they will elicit a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. We had discussed about all types of hypersensitivity reaction in our, one of our videos. Now these uh, antibodies will react, they will elicit a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction against our cardiac antigens. And as a result, what happens is that we know what happens in a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. There will be complement activation. And because of complement activation, macrophages 
and neutrophils and other cells they are recruited so the pathogenesis involves type 4 hypersensitivity reaction and type 2 hypersensitivity reaction in combination so this is what happens in an acute rheumatic disease so all of what we have discussed so far they happen in an acute rheumatic heart disease now this acute rheumatic heart disease after uh, healing and fibrosis and scar formation once they happen once the healing occurs and with subsequent recurrence when these two combination that's a combination of healing and scarring of the inflammation and the uh, recurrence of rheumatic fever when these two happen together they will progress into the chronic rheumatic heart disease so that's the pathogenesis which is occurring now let's move on to the part of morphology in an acute rheumatic heart disease what happens so we have said that the type 4 hypersensitivity and type 2 uh, hypersensitivity work together and as a result of their com combination inflammation occurs right so inflammation occurs in the heart now where does these inflammatory uh, uh, reactions happen they happen actually in all the three layers of heart so that's the typical point all three layers of heart are involved and the inflammation uh, occurs with the formation of a peculiar body that we and we call that body the ASCO bodies so when inflammation occurs how do we know that has occurred morphologically we can determine the ASCO bodies in all three layers of the heart which are the three layers they are the pericarditis the uh, myocardium the pericardium the myocardium and the endocardium so all three layers are involved and the pathognomonic lesion are the ASCO bodies they can be seen microscopically and they are pathognomonic. So their presence indicates rheumatic heart disease. Now what is this ask of body? So ask of body develops in three stages actually. So if we are going to speak about it. When the reaction first occurs, there is this early phase. So when the inflammatory reaction, that is a type 4 and type 2 cells start to occur, what happens is that in all the three layers of the heart, there is a perivascular focus of these cells which are involved. So what are the cells that are involved? They are the CD4 T cells, they are the macrophages, and they are the antibodies. Antibodies will develop into plasma cells, right? Or it is the B cells which develop into plasma cells, and the plasma cells will produce antibodies and neutrophils. So there will be a perivascular focus around the blood vessels of the heart. There will be a perivascular focus of T lymphocytes, T cells, then the plasma cells, then we'll have the macrophages, neutrophils. And then what happens? They will organize into a granulomatous lesion because of type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. So let's just draw that. So this is our heart cardiac muscle cells. These are our cardiac muscle cells. And in between these cardiac muscle cells, we'll have a granulomatous lesion. And this granulomatous lesion, it will be constituted by, there will be T cells, there will be the big plasma cells, and there will be our neutrophils. And along with that, the macrophages, what happens is that upon the cytokines, so we have said when we spoke about pathogenesis, the macrophages are activated, right? These macrophages, they will develop into a specific type of cells known as Anichkow cells. So Anichkow cells. What are Anichkow cells? So Anichkow cells are actually uh, activated, pump activated macrophages. They're very large. And these macrophages, they contain round to ovoid nuclei. And the chromatin inside it, uh, the peculiarity of the chromatin is it condenses into a wave-like pattern. So there is a ribbon wavy pattern. So once again, we, uh, if we draw, these are our anisocytes, that is plump activated macrophages with a large ovoid or send round to ovoid nucleus having the chromatin that is condensed into a slender wavy ribbon-like pattern. This is our anisocyte cells. So let's write that down, their features. First one is their plump activated macrophage. This is, a, uh, uh, this is about the NHK cell. And then they have round to ovoid nuclei, large cytoplasm as well. And they have a slender baby ribbon-like chromatin. They also have an alternative name. They are also called as the caterpillar cells because of how the 
chromatin and the nucleus are seen on the longitudinal section. They are known as the caterpillar cells. So that's about the Anishkov cells or the caterpillar cells. Now this whole structure which we have drawn here, this granulomatous lesion, this is known as the ASCOF bodies or ASCOF nodules. So we have an early phase and then we have uh, the uh, granulomatous phase. And later, ASCOF bodies will then undergo healing. And in the late phase, scar formation occurs. So that's what happens in the late phase. So that is a microscopic feature which we have discussed. Now what happens macroscopically? So what is the gross identification? The gross identification is the presence of vegetation. There will be presence of small barky vegetations called as veruke. So along these are our valves. So let's mark this. This is our atria. And this is the cusp. This is the coda tendons, tendine of the, tendine of the valves. So along the line of co closure of the valves, small varty projections will, vegetations will occur. And this vegetation is known as veruke. And these are seen in rheumatic heart diseases. Now what are the features if we are to describe the veruke? Firstly, where are they present? They are present in the left side of the heart. That is among the left side, most predominantly in the mitral valve, followed by the aortic valve. Secondly, they do not get dislodged. So what it means is that these, uh, these vegetations do not get dislodged and enter the circulation and form and you know the thrombus, thromboemboli formation. The chances are actually less and they are actually fixed along the lines of closure of valves. So their position along the line of closure of valve. So our veruke are our first uh, feature, gross feature. And the second feature is a macalum plaque. So what is a macalum plaque? So let's draw it. These are actually map-like wrinkled irregular vegetation. So it's a map-like irregular vegetation. So let's name it this. It is a Macallum plaque. What is? What are the characteristic features? So a Macallum plaque. It looks a map-like wrinkled vegetation. Where is it present? It is present on the left atrium. Where along the left atrium? Along the posterior wall of the left atrium. That is the position behind the mitral valve. So this is the location of the macarium plaque and it is actually a subendocardial deposit. So it's a subendocardial deposit. These are the three points to be noted about macarium plaque. So the, that is a gross feature and the gross features which we have discussed so far, this, these are actually endocardial features, right? We said that acute rheumatic heart disease affects endocardium, myocardium and pericardium. Now in myocardium, we will have our ASCOF bodies microscopically. ASCOF nodules will be seen at several sites and in the pericardium, what happens is that there will be fibrin deposition between the two layers. So fibrin deposits on both layers of the pericardium that will lead to fibrinous pericarditis and this fibrinous pericarditis it's also called it has an alternative name that is the bread and butter pericarditis and how does this present this is one of the clinical presentation of rheumatic fever and because of the uh, the bread and butter pericarditis a patient may actually present as a pericardial friction rub so that's about the acute rheumatic heart disease now let's move on to the chronic rheumatic heart disease in the chronic rheumatic heart disease, as we have said, rheumatic fever is a multi-system disorder, right? So a chronic rheumatic heart disease actually involves both. It includes ex cardiac manifestations and it also includes the extra cardiac system. So there are two cardiac and extra cardiac. How do they develop? We have said they develop when the acute inflammatory reactions heals uh, with scar formation and when there are recurrent episodes, then what happens is that the uh, acute progresses into a chronic rheumatic heart disease. Now what are the changes that are happening in the valves? So we have the valves here. What happens is that these valves, uh, what happens is that firstly there is thickening of valve, the thickening of heart valves. Then what happens is that there is shortening and fusion of the coda tendine. Coda tendine. And this is due to fibrosis. So fibrosis is the piece and because of fibrosis, the heart valves get thickened and the coda tendine, this we have said, this is our tendine, this is our uh, uh, cusp of the valve and this is our atrium. Atrium, cusp, tendon. So the, these valves will get thickened and as a result, what happens to the opening? 
the opening actually this is the normal heart opening of the uh, mitral and uh, of, of the heart valves of the atrioventricular valves what happens is that because of rheumatic fever the opening will actually reduce and there will be a stenosis that develops so in chronic rheumatic heart diseases what happens is that there will be stenosis and which valves are usually affected as we have said earlier the mitral valve is usually affected in 66 percent of the cases followed by the aortic valve in 25 percent of the cases and then rarely we have the tricuspid valve and very rarely we have the pulmonary valve involvement so it's usually the mitral valve which is involved and because of the fibrosis what happens is that there will be a mitral sternosis in fact the only reason why mitral sternosis occurs is because of rheumatic heart fever now the narrowing of the valves uh, lead to a characteristic appearance and this appearance is described as a fish mouth appearance so the, this uh, is also called as a fish mouth appearance so that's what happens uh, in the chronic rheumatic heart disease and as i've said earlier there are extra cardiac manifestations so in extra cardiac manifestations include first one is migratory polyarthritis so there will be migratory polyarthritis what does it mean so that let's take the term there is arthritis that is inflammation of the joints poly means several joints more than uh, both the joints of the upper limb of the lower limb are involved and migratory means what happens is that your one joint there is a migration of the inflammation so firstly one large joint will become painful and swollen and then what happens is that that inflammation will reside and then another joint gets involved after a certain period of time so there is a migration of the inflammation that's migratory polyarthritis then there is erythema marginatum so there is a bathing suit pattern of skin rashes which is known as the erythema marginatum there will be red rashes skin rashes that's erythema marginatum the third feature is Sindenham's chorea Sindenham's chorea is involuntary it's a neurological disorder involving involuntary movements and finally there could be subcutaneous nodules subcutaneous nodules where are the subcutaneous nodules found they are found in the extensor aspect so in the extensor aspect of the body there will be subcutaneous nodules these nodules are usually attached to the tendons or ligaments in the extensor aspect of the body now how do we remember this these uh, four manifestations there is a code for that and that is space it's called as space so what is space space is subcutaneous nodules subcutaneous nodules P is actually pancarditis so it is pancarditis what is a? a is actually arthritis that is migratory polyarthritis c is chorea syndenance chorea and e is erythema marginatum so these are the five manifestations or these are actually uh, we'll, when we discuss about john's criteria next these are the five major criteria uh, included in john's criteria for diagnosis so now the clinical features so usually the acute rheumatic fever the acute rheumatic heart disease they usually present with uh, there will be a fever and then there will, there will be arrhythmias there will be pericardial friction rip because of pericarditis uh, because of fibrinous pericarditis as we have said earlier and they could also present with tachycardia these are the usual manifestations of acute rheumatic heart disease whereas in chronic rheumatic heart disease as we have said the extra cardiac manifestations are more so here we'll see that the cardiac manifestations are more whereas in uh, chronic rhd the usually the manifestation is the arthritis which is the most common and then there would be carditis the features of mitral stenosis and all of that that will move into the complication so what happens in chronic the uh, carditis what happens in chronic rheumatic heart disease we have said that there is mitral stenosis right ms because of mitral stenosis the valve opening is reduced so this is our heart and this is our lungs and here is our mitral valve so in mitral stenosis occurs what happens is that blood pooling will occur in the left atrium so there will be left atrium enlargement and because of the left atrium enlargement that will affect the pulmonary vasculature that is present here right so here what happens is that uh, there will be a venous congestion there is a chronic venous congestion in the lungs and how does chronic venous congestion usually present as the chronic venous congestion in the lungs present as either as dyspnea 
or as hemoptysis or a combination. This is how they usually present. And then what happens is that this could progress to the uh, pulmonary, the other side, and as a result, there could be pulmonary hypertension. So the right side of the heart may get affected, leading to right ventricular hypertrophy, which could progress into right-sided heart failure. So these are the sequel of complications which occur in chronic rheumatic heart disease. And the presentation may be as hemoptysis or dyspnea. There is also another complication which we know. Enlarged left atrium, they will favor thrombi formation. And this thrombi formation, they can undergo dislodge into the other sides and that could lead to thromboembolism. Thromboembolism. That is another complication. So chronic rheumatic heart disease, it may also present as infective endocarditis. The reason is the damaged heart valves, they provide a site for bacteria to grow. So they could also present as infective endocarditis. And then they could present as the other features that is chorea, erythema and subcutaneous nodules. So that's about the clinical features. Now coming to the diagnosis. Diagnosis is based on Jones criteria. So what is Jones criteria? Jones criteria includes major criteria and minor criteria. So there are minor criteria. There are major criteria. What is the major criteria? The major criteria includes the space. So we had discussed it is a subcutaneous nodule, the pancarditis, migratory polyarthritis and chorea, syndenance chorea and erythema marginatum. These are the major manifestations and the minor manifestations include one is fever, then history of streptococcus infection and then there will be raised acute pace reaction APR, arthralgia. So these are the minor manifestations of Jones criteria. Now diagnosis is based if there are two major criteria is fulfilled plus a positive history. So if there is a history of streptococcal infection with two major uh, manifestation or the other possibility is one major plus two minor. So either you need to have two major criteria and a history of streptococcal infection or you need to have one major criteria or two minor criteria if fulfilled then we diagnose it as rheumatic uh, fever. So there is also one more feature in the ECG one of the minor criteria is PR interval is prolonged. That is an ECG finding. Now about the complications we had already discussed our complications. First one is infective endocarditis and then there is risk for thromboembolism and we had said the features that occur that will be CVC lung and then there is right uh, ventricular failure right which and right ventricular hypertrophy which then produce, progresses to right heart failure. So these are some of the complications of rheumatic heart fever and prognosis. Prognosis is actually variable and it depends upon how much the uh, recurrence occurs. Usually the manifestations reside. So the clinical manifestations reside after four to six weeks. So by four to six weeks, the clinical manifestations are usually poor, but if they recur, then the prognosis is poor. And long term prognosis is now possible because of the valvular surgical repair of the valves or prosthetic replacement. So that's about the rheumatic heart disease.